such an amazing audience, such an amazing country, and such an amazing future. Okay. Welcome back, everybody. Let's rock and roll. Let's go back to the, to the future. Uh, some still things about the housekeeping. Uh, we still have quite many open chairs here. Raise up a hand who has a free chair next to them. So people from the back, you see there are many, many open spaces. Take your bags uh, away from the open spaces so we can start. Um, we are going to talk now about the um, topic which is kind of interesting. Nobody knows if it's already here or not, and that's uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, we have here a longtime friend of Estonia who's currently running uh, marketplaces at Shipstead, a large media company, uh, before did uh, peer index, calculated expertise on, uh, on Twitter, uh, as well who really wants to get the Labrador dog to their family. So everybody welcome. Uh, Azim Asar, thank you. Thanks, Yuri. Tere, tere, Tallinn, hello. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. I haven't been to Estonia for 14 years, and uh, the country has done amazing things uh, in that time. Uh, so my name is Azim. I'm uh, at Azim on Twitter, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, some reflections on our AI future uh, when machines have minds. Um, today, I work at uh, Shipstead, which is a media and marketplaces business, but I've been looking at AI uh, as a field for about 15 years. So artificial intelligence is a very broad umbrella term uh, that we, we hear used a lot, mostly because the marketing department has understood that artificial intelligence is sexy. Uh, but it means a lot of different things to different people, uh, from some of the core technologies, um, We've got machine learning and deep learning, uh, some of the other technologies like natural language processing. But what it really means for us is, can we design and build uh, computer systems that can solve quite complex problems? I mean, in a nutshell, that is, uh, that is what we mean by, by AI. And AI is often put into three broad categories uh, uh, in the world. So you have, uh, in the green, ANI, artificial narrow intelligence. That is, can you get a computer to do a particular task really, really well, uh, often better than a human can? But it can only do that one task. It can't do lots of different things. And that is today's state of artificial uh, narrow intelligence. When you play your chess computer and you lose, that's ANI at work. A lot of the excitement recently um, has been up at this end. Um, and this is also where science fiction puts artificial intelligence. It's artificial superintelligence. Can we build computers that are cleverer than humans, that can do much more than we can, that can learn much faster? And this stuff is still really in the realm of, of science fiction, although because it's, it's about killer robots, uh, it's often pretty exciting for people. And this area here, artificial general intelligence, is the idea that we might be able to build a computer that will do lots of the things that a human can do. So I call it humanish. But in all of the noise that's out there in artificial intelligence, today the state of the art is down here. It's artificial narrow intelligence. We haven't moved past that particular point. Um, we've got people like DeepMind and Google trying to do great work in that sector to move us along towards yellow. But fundamentally, much of the work that is going to improve our lives in the next few years is in the green. So my first reflection is that an AI future is absolutely inevitable uh, for us. Um, and there are a number of reasons for it. Um, the first is that there's a lot more processing power through CPUs and GPUs and, and the march of Moore's law. And that processing power is allowing us to process the, the data that we are now creating as a species. We're increasing our amount of data by 44-fold in the next 11 years. And any machine, any human needs data in order to learn how to behave in the world. And what the combination of processing power and, and data is doing is it's enabling uh, what are new algorithms in commerce. And these are algorithms like deep learning, which we've, we've heard about, 
even though those algorithms are 20 plus years old, it's only been in the last few years that there's been enough data and enough processing power for them to work. And we'll see some examples later. But there are two other reasons why AI is, is inevitable. The, 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 the other is that business is now digital. So over the last 20 years, businesses have gone from being physical things through to being electronic things. And as electronic things, they can be dealt very well with, with uh, software. So the Estonian e-citizenship is a great example of that. But the final is that there's a strong financial rationale for firms and governments to use AI. And because of this, that economic incentive exists. There's an inevitable path for us to use more and more of it. So when we think about Moore's law, I think it's worth looking at this graph to understand just what we've done as a species when it comes to building the tools for comp computation. So we create more transistors, which are the fundamental unit for, for processing, every tenth of a second than there are stars in the, in the galaxy. And 60 years ago, when we made our first transistor, um, it cost uh, you know, it cost a certain amount of money. It cost about $10, $15 to make. Today, we're making them for billionths of a dollar, and we're making trillions of trillions of transistors um, every year. And that shows up in a chart like this, which shows the, the power of this device, my Apple II, my Apple Watch. Back in 1985, you'd need to buy a, a Cray supercomputer for about $15 million. It would fit in a room, and it would give you 1.6 gigaflops of processing. Today, the Apple Watch gives me more than double that and costs a few hundred bucks. And this is a relentless march that we've seen in the underlying processing that we need in order to make these algorithms work. And in recent years, there's been a, a step change in a technology called the GPU, the Graphic Processing Unit. And I'll just draw attention to this thing on the right, which is this is a, a graph showing how good computers are at identifying objects in images. And the red line shows the number of times they get it wrong. And you see in 2010, they got it wrong 28% of the time. But by 2014, that's dropped to 7%. And what's driven that has been this new technology in green the arrival of the GPU. And these tools are at the hands of any of us today, when even 30 years ago, the top researchers didn't have access to them. Another thing that's really important has been for the software developers amongst you, we've moved from developing our software this way in spaghetti to developing this way with microservices. Um, and, and the point about a microservice is that it very narrowly describes what a piece of code needs to do. So if you're developing an AI system, you only have to develop the system to figure out what happens from here to here. Whereas back in the 80s, if you're an AI researcher, you had to figure out all sorts of complicated things, which frankly, even a human couldn't do. And any of you who've worked in software development know what legacy code looks like. All of this is coming together in a really powerful force, which uh, we call the, the lock-in loop. And the lock-in loop is a reinforcing cycle that means that once you start to benefit from AI, you'll continue to benefit from it. And it runs something like this, that you take AI, you put it in your product. It makes your product better. Because your product is better, more people use it, and that generates more data, which you can then put back into your AI system to make the AI system cleverer to make a better product. And at the same time, it increases your profits, and you can take your profits and you can put them back into your product making your AI system better. And we've got into this loop now in several domains. So in video games, you need to have AI. If you don't have AI, you, you can't build a first-person shooter. In search engines, you need to have AI. In mobile UI, you need to have AI. So as these industries go, fall, every new entrant needs to invest in the same set of technologies. But that said, today, AI can't open doors and play chess at the same time. So it's important to recognize that today's AIs are very narrow, and so they are bad at the everyday tasks that we take for granted, like opening doors, like chatting to people, like figuring out what they need to do at any given day. And they're also not so good at playing, at combining tasks. So a human can easily be playing a game of Go and then pause, and the same person can go off and book a travel a, a flight. Um, 
or the same human could translate English to Estonian and potentially perform surgery, but you'd struggle to find a single AI system that could do both. And this is called Moravec's paradox. It's this idea that, um, as well, that humans, there's a set of things that machines are very good at, which are calculations, essentially, and there's a set of things humans are extremely good at, which is opening doors and living in the real world, which humans are very good at. So is a se selection of things that machines can't yet do. They can't emote, show emotion, and they can't empathize. We have to fake that empathy. They can't learn without data. Uh, and humans are very good at learning without data or learning with limited amounts of data. And this is one of the forefront areas of, of research right now. And that means that machines can't handle unprecedented situations. They just don't know when they haven't been programmed, when they haven't been exposed to the data. Um, and they can't set their own goals, uh, crucially. And being able to set your goals is one of the core parts of being a, an, an entity that has agency. So to that extent, today's AIs are much like a typical machine. They augment and leverage human capability. Um, they don't replace us, and you certainly wouldn't want them on your football team. But that said, AI can still do amazing things, particularly in the narrow range of domains that uh, they, we've trained them in, and they can compete with or exceed the best of human capability, and I'll show you some examples. So, in terms of looking at what's in an image and figuring out, well, this has got a cat or a dog or a car, uh, computers are generally now better than humans, and this is the uh, error rate of the, uh, the best algorithms, running from a 28% error rate in 2010 to 6% in 2015, beating the humans last year. And of course, the machines get better every year, so they'll be beyond that uh, by, the, by the next latitude. Computers are getting better uh, than humans at video games as well. So this is uh, some work that Google has done at DeepMind, showing with a baseline of 100% what performance their best AI system is getting. And you see that it's 112% at the worst games and 2,600%, 26 times better at the best games. Um, what's interesting is their learning curve. Uh, there's a researcher called Miles Brundage who has shown that the improvement in these algorithms was a factor of two in just one year. So again, where will these systems be in video gaming in a year's time? Um, it's kind of miserable if you're sort of addicted to playing boxing uh, on your Xbox. Uh, They've long been better than, than humans at chess, of course, uh, back in 96. But what's quite interesting is that you know, a world championship contender hits around here, and we're already up at this sort of ELO rating um, with some of the current systems. So you know, computer chess is, a, is another game altogether. Uh, recently, we've trained uh, neural networks to answer IQ tests. Uh, which uh, I don't know if they give them to schools in Estonia, but in the UK, we're slightly obsessed with IQ testing our kids. Uh, and the problem is that last year, um, a, a neural net scored as highly as an average four-year-old child on a verbal IQ test. Uh, that was last year. Again, where will it be this year? Where will it be next year? Um, forces us to rethink uh, the value of those tests. Even in surgery, robotic surgery, where uh, robots are, are helping surgeons is taking off. But recently, um, we had a, a system called the STAR system, which is as good as a human when it comes to suturing intestinal tissue. So this is a pig's intestine down here. But just up here is that green dot shows how good the robotic system is compared to the error rate of the human system up here. Lower is better. And even in this more complex and creative domain of writing a caption for a picture, um, I quite like this one because um, you've got this picture here, and these two neural nets work together to come up with a caption, a group of people shopping at an outdoor market, which is pretty accurate. There are many vegetables at the fruit stand, which is also quite accurate, but I'm sitting there going, it's vegetables. Why have you said fruit stand? It's obviously a vegetable stand. Um, but it is showing that even in the domains that we thought were creativity, you're starting to get uh, machines in there. And of course, driving has also yielded to machine learning. Uh, so over a billion kilometers has been driven autonomously in the Tesla S, and crash rates are much lower than elsewhere. 
But my sixth reflection is that AI can also be dangerous. So um, you, you can amplify the biases that already exist um, through the shortcuts that you take. A lot of this is happening in racial profiling and stereotyping. So Google Photos had a, an, an incident where it couldn't recognize certain people and classified them as animals. There's an Israeli startup that predicts from your face whether you might be a, a terrorist or a pedophile. Um, there are also ri risks around the concentration of power because a lot of the data is increasingly concentrated in just a few firms. And equally, the capabilities are very proliferated because any developer can actually access the tools. My seventh reflection is that there's no Miles Dyson. Uh, Miles was the uh, guy behind the Terminator Cyberdyne Systems chip that launched Arnold Schwarzenegger's robot career. We're all Miles. There isn't a single genius working away. We're all playing a part in this, either through providing the data, through our tweeting and our Instagramming, or by working in industries that are building incremental improvements in AI. Um, and that means that this is another part of the inevitability of the arrival of, of this sort of bright future. And there's good and there's bad. The good is that lots of domains will get much better. There will be more economic efficiency. There'll be more capital efficiency. Essentially, we'll be providing a productivity enhancing technology to release capital and labor. But the bad is that it may be in the hands of a few tech giants. We may find that there are exclusions, people get excluded because they're in minority groups. And we may find that professions narrow or jobs disappear. So as with many technologies, there might be winners and there might be losers. Thank you. Thank you, Azim. We have time for maybe just one question. We have a panel afterwards. Any, any questions? There, there's one. Oh, yeah, sure. So on the last slide, you had uh, something about the bad, and mm -hmm. the bad was that it's uh, going to be in the hands of the few tech giants. Why mm -hmm. is it bad? Well, because if you concentrate power in, in any... Just think of Google, Google and search. Yeah, yeah. If you concentrate power in any place, you end up with, you'll end up with abuses, which is why we're starting. We had Microsoft investigated for monopolistic practices, and now the EU is looking at Google and looking at Facebook and saying, do we like the concentration of power? Uh, and at that point, you may end up finding that our interfaces with the world are very, very strongly mediated by profit-seeking companies. And you don't, where's then the role for civil society and sort of discussion and alternate views? You also run a well-known AI newsletter. So how can people find that? Yeah, so I have a newsletter which is called Exponential View. and. Uh, you can find it at the URL exponentialview.co. I couldn't afford the full domain. <laughs> exponentialview.co. Or just find Azim at, uh, at, at Twitter. Twitter. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Yuri. Thank you. So you can take a seat. Yep. We follow on uh, with a similar topic and the panel, more on the kind of practical applications of uh, using this kind of intelligence.